It's that time again. The annual conference of the American Society of Ag Consultants, otherwise known as ASAC, is going to be held in Fort Myers, Florida, this November 4th and 5th. Kirk Covington is one of nine professionals who will address the conference. The other speakers who will cover a wide range of topics represent Florida Farm Bureau, Florida Citrus Commission, University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture, National Ag Law Center, Risk Mitigators and Advisors, Tyler Associates, as well as the lead economist for dairy at Cobank, and myself, Chrissy Wozniak, from North American Ag. The day and a half of presentations will be followed by ag tours on Tuesday afternoon at Echo Farms, one of my favorite places here in Fort Myers. Attendees will experience farming at its most creative, with unique demonstrations, plants, and techniques being used to help farmers and urban gardeners in developing countries. A second tour at ECHO will showcase simple technologies that can improve food, water, and shelter for millions of people. A third tour of a hydroponic grower is also being planned. For more information and to register, visit www.agconsultants.org. That's www.agconsultants.org. See you there. Our sponsor today is GAPS, established five years ago, GAPS brings water remediation and soil amendments to the agricultural businesses of Ontario, Canada. Phosphorus runoff is a big deal. This company coordinates and facilitates grant-based projects that are built to test new phosphorus removal products on an ongoing basis. GAPS provides these successful R&D products in their toolbox of solutions and are sold to the producer, golf course, and municipalities. Their goal is to help build better soil and to manage water without the use of chemicals. Visit GAPS at gapsontario.com or visit their link in the show notes. Hi, and welcome to the North American Egg Spotlight. I'm Chrissy Wozniak. My guest today has spent over 35 years in radio. He's the host of All Ag, All Day Ag News from the nation's only full-time farm station. From Lubbock, Texas, I'd like to welcome Tony St. James. Welcome, Tony. How are you today? Hi, Chrissy. Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. So can you tell me a bit about your background? Well, a little about mine. It's kind of interesting that I'm doing anything at all in agriculture because I didn't grow up in ag. As a matter of fact, I tried to avoid it like the plague. Uh, My father was a John Deere parts manager. I have an uncle who owned a John Deere dealership. Had uh, anyway, there there was plenty of ag around me. I grew up in in small ag communities, but that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a top forty DJ back in the eighties in the heyday of radio, and and that's what I was doing. Along the way, my wife and I uh, ended up. uh, Well, we realized that places like Dallas or Houston or Austin or New York or wherever had plenty of really good disc jockeys already on the air. So I could go, but I wouldn't be probably one of the best. And and that's okay. You don't have to be the best. But we realized that small towns had radio stations, and they deserved really good stations as well. So uh, we bought a, a small town station, a town of 3,000 people, I actually started with two Visa cards that we maxed out, wow. put a down payment on the down payment to get it started. And then it was uh, after that, it was a lot of faith, a lot of prayer and divine intervention. Along the way, had a had a uh, guy that we hired for our, our ag director. He came in, did it for about 18 months, and he left. And when he did, we couldn't find anyone to replace him. In the meantime, the show had to go on, so I stepped in and started doing ag. I had no idea what I was doing. Along the way, had uh, had uh, a, a professor at Texas Tech that I was interviewing, and I'm sure I was asking really stupid questions at the time. Uh, after it was over, we were at a table sharing a meal, and he, without looking up, he said, you know, if you'd like to have a great interview you might ask whoever you're going to talk to, what are three good questions? And that way you don't have to know anything about the subject, but you'll get a great interview. And so I, I implemented that that's and great. have been doing that now for 30 plus years. Wow. That's, that's really cool. And so can you tell me about 
All Ag All Day, the the radio and its podcast now too, right? Sure, sure. So All Ag All Day uh, is about 20 years old now. Wow. Um, back in the early t- uh, 2000s, we decided that we have an AM and an FM station uh, in Floyd, Ada, Texas. There are more livestock in the county than people. Um, but the FM was a country station, and we were really struggling with what to do on the AM. We didn't want to do the Rush Limbaugh thing. Everybody else seemed to be doing that. So we had narrowed it down to two things, all ag or all comedy, and decided that comedy was going to take too much time, and I'm not funny, so... (laughs) We realized that maybe ag is we can make this thing work. And that's that was the I guess the the spark that lit the fire for all ag all day. Now it's uh 24 hours, seven days a week on uh, a station there in the Lubbock area. We also have uh 22 hours, seven days a week on a station in Amarillo, and that is literally ag nonstop. Along the way, we also syndicate programs. So we have two one-hour shows that go to over 20 stations across uh, six states. And then we have short-form, two- to three-minute programs that air from Fresno and Modesto, California, all the way up to Utica and Rome, New York. No way. That is that is really cool. And so who's your typical listener? Farmers, ranchers. Yeah. And that's it. Because... Uh, it, I use the the term LDP that it was an acronym for loan deficiency payments. And we don't really talk about that anymore, but <laughs> nobody in their right mind wants to keep up with LDP payments. If you're not in the industry, mm-hmm. it, it's, you know, it's much like talking about ARC and PLC decisions for insurance. If you're not involved in production ag, you, you don't really care about that. So we, very rarely we'll get a listener that's not really what we would consider a class one producer. We might get some who have small acreage. Um, we might get some who've retired, maybe still landowners, uh, might get a, a, a ag banker along the way or somebody involved in insurance. Uh, one interesting note, we, we've had a faithful listener in Atlanta, Georgia for years who listened to our online stream. He wasn't in ag, but he was involved in moving produce uh, as a middleman uh, from companies to grocery outlets. And and so he would listen to try to find out what the trends might be to help give him an edge. So there you go. That's who listens, I think. Wow. And then what kind of areas of the industry do you cover? Or is it pretty much broad spectrum? Oh, I think I was telling you earlier, I'm, I'm, feel like I play in the shallow end of the pool a lot. I, I play on the splash pad, but don't throw me in the deep end because I don't know firsthand what many producers go through. So what I do is I ask a lot of questions of a lot of different people. So we cover everything from uh, members of Congress, uh, where we go to D.C. twice a year, spend a week and, and actually sit down and talk with uh, members of Congress, and we talk about ag and rural issues. And when we talk about it, it, it's an interview. By the way, you do a great job with your interviews because you're really good at at teeing up a question and then allowing whoever you're asking to to really extrapolate from that question. And, uh, you know, so often when we see interviews in the media today, whoever is interviewing is really trying to guide the conversation and throw their ideas in the whole way. And Mm -hmm. if you don't agree with me, then you're wrong. And, And I think we miss out on the opportunity to learn so much. So what I do is just what you're doing. I ask questions, sit back and, and listen, we cover everything from what's happening in DC. Uh, we cover the major commodities. So corn, soybeans, wheat, sorghum, cotton, cattle, hogs. Uh, We cover uh, from time to time some of the specialty crops. We cover trade issues. We cover infrastructure. Uh, We just try to cover anything that might be of interest 
not to just one producer in one part of the, the country, but we try to cover the entire thing because even though many don't aren't concerned with the Water Resources Development Act or WERDA, if you take away our ability to move product up and down the, the Mississippi and Illinois rivers, we've got a major issue nationwide. So that's why even WERDA for a, a dry land producer in Arizona doesn't mean much. It's still an important topic. Yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more with so much of media now is, is really based on trying to get the answer you want. Right. Um, but yeah, I can tell from your interviews as well, you're curious, you're curious, you want to know what's happening and want to know the truth. And you, you, you really, really try to, to get the entire story for the listener. And that's, that's really great. I really appreciate that. Well, thanks uh, again. You know, I think it's, it's the way most of us are. Mm -hmm. If you're having a conversation uh, at a restaurant with somebody you just met, or you're, you're on a, I don't know about a train, but a plane, somebody next to you, they're going to ask you a question. You're going to ask them questions back. And that's how we, we build dialogue and that's how we really learn. So uh, you've got a great style. Uh, thanks. So, and you clearly have your finger on the pulse of North American ag industry. So what is the overall tone that you're hearing as we step into the 2022 growing season? The overall tone is extreme concern. I think I, I, I was looking for one word and I couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. uh, we needed an adjective in there because it, it's not concern. It is extreme concern because there are so many things that are, are volatile right now uh, that, that, you know, one spark and the, the whole thing could go up in flames. Let's talk prices. I mean, we're looking at historic prices right now, whether you're, you're talking uh, where we are with wheat or where we are with cotton. Uh, cotton's only been higher than it is now one time in history. Wow. And that was uh, about 10 years ago, but it wasn't necessarily a fundamental type thing. By the way, when you think, oh, $2 cotton would be a great thing. Well, it is a great thing if you've got cotton to sell and you've got a buyer. Unfortunately, the last time it hit $2, it took many out of the industry because they couldn't cover the margin calls. We don't think about those type of things when we watch prices move up and down. Uh, there's an elasticity with those, those prices. And once you break that band, everything comes off. So I think, I think keeping in mind the, the fact that we've got prices that probably, I would say, are not sustainable at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, we're going to hit a recession. When we hit that recession, those prices are going to have to come down. So I think that's one flashpoint. I think another one is obviously what's happening uh, in the Russia-Ukraine situation right now. That is taking the number four supplier exporter of corn off the market. I don't see any way that they're going to harvest any of their, their winter wheat at this point. So now you're, you're taking away uh, much needed supplies when prices are high. The, high. the prices were already there before all this started. Uh, so who's going to step in and fill those roles? I don't know that the U.S. can do it because we're dealing with a drought situation right now through a good portion of the, the central plains. There are areas, uh, I'll use Texas as an example. I would be surprised if we harvest 50% wow. of the wheat wow, that went in that because bad. we've lost so much due to the drought. And when you've already felled that much wheat off, what's happening in other states? Uh, will, we, will we get some of those spring wheat uh, acres to go in or, or will they still be dealing with drought? So that's another issue we're dealing with. And then you throw in things like um, regulation, and and now I'm 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 going to tee this one up on EPA. Uh, right now, it seems as though, and and I, I'll use the word it seems, it appears. I don't know that this is actually happening. That the administration uh, has turned from 
being friendly to ag to being maybe friendly to those who drive a more environmental agenda. Um, and oftentimes that environmental agenda, even though it's very closely related to the ag agenda, mm -hmm. they are on different sides of the coin. And it's as if one side has to win and the other has to lose instead of working together for what's good for the nation. It's very polarized. And so I think uh, with EPA, whether it's waters of the U.S., I live in a county right now that when it rains, if it rains again, it has the most lakes of any county in the United States. Unfortunately, they're playa lakes. So as it gets dry, every one of them dries up. And then uh, there's a county in Minnesota that becomes the, the number one state for lakes. But in this county in Texas, the way waters of the U.S. is being pushed, that affects the entire county. Every acre of ag in one county, a 900 square mile county. So that's not good for ag. Um, yeah, I would, there's a I would way say that's probably the, the balance, biggest, yeah. biggest travesty of this administration is that right there. Well, and 30 by 30. <laughs> Exactly. And so you've got other things as well. What about the uh, uh, the uh, now lesser prairie chicken? You had groups coming together. You had landowners, you had producers, you had other in, others that were invested in this to try to find a way to increase populations. By the way, we know populations decrease in drought. It has to be wet for the that lesser prairie chicken to thrive. Well, we're back into a drought. Numbers are going down, but instead of recognizing that, we're now going to, to put it on the endangered species list, which change it. That takes all the work that groups were working together and you've thrown that out. Yeah. And so I, I, that's what I'm talking about with the extreme concern at this point, because what you do today may not matter tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And what are you hearing in terms of supply chain issues for manufacturers? Oh, it I'm I'm going to kind of step back for a moment. I'm in Ocean Springs, Mississippi right now. Mm -hmm. I'm at a a locally owned print shop who cannot get any toner for their wow. printers they can't get certain types of paper to print on. And you might say, well, that's, that's a print shop. What's that have to do with ag? The fact is, is it's a locally owned community business. And when we start losing our community businesses, that starts affecting the population of our small communities, our rural communities. When you start losing that, you start losing the opportunity to have people who can help on the farm, the, the labor situation. So suddenly, oh, and by the way, when you start seeing that happen, what happens to uh, the potential for tax revenue? That starts dropping as well, which then cuts into our schools. And suddenly, before you know it, we have ghost towns. Yeah. Uh, so that's one side of the supply chain that we don't really think of because we're so caught up in ag. We have issues with trying to get our product out. Uh, I've been in New Orleans uh, for, let's see, I was there a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I'll be back in there on Friday. And what we're finding is barge rates are now moving to their highest level ever. Uh, so those are some issues that we're looking at looking at issues of trying to get parts in as well. We already know we're, we're missing out on uh, glyphosate. Uh, we're, we're seeing shortages of fertilizer. Obviously, shortages will increase the cost of production. We have some producers who are looking at different crops now based upon the availability of what chemicals or fertilizer they can get. So it's not even 
a point of growing for what the market needs based on price, we have producers who are having to make decisions based upon cost. That's it. Yeah. And think of the ripple effect to the, you know, even, you know, the seed guys, if all of a sudden they thought this huge order is coming in and then everyone has to pivot to something else, you know, what are, how does, how does that affect everything? And, you know, let's use one, one, uh, mode here. Uh, it's an easy one to do. It's roundup ready. Okay. So let's say roundup ready cotton. Um, sure. It was a great way to, to clean the fields of weeds, but part of the reason I think we had the roundup to begin with based just, again, this is me drawing from just years of questions and answers was because we had lost the ability to effectively have people who could work the fields and could hold the, hold the weeds down, which by the way, is the best way to do it. But once you started losing them, you had to have an answer for what can we do to clear the weeds? And so that's where Roundup Ready Cotton really stepped in. Even though it seems pretty dire right now with the ability to find chemicals and fertilizer, there's a silver lining here. And I think the silver lining is it's the opportunity to reinvent what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know what that is. I'm, I, I, you know, it, it, I don't have a dog in this fight, but somebody's going to come up with some solutions here. And when they do, I think we'll see the entire ag industry pivot again, Mm -hmm. because again, late nineties, we pivoted from conventional over to, you know, the roundup ready beans and and cotton. What's the next pivot for us? It takes some kind of stimulus to, to cause us as an industry to move. So even though it's, it's getting bleak right now, I'm really excited because I know we're just one or two years away from something big happening. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, you said that very well. Um, and if if nothing else, you know, humans and farmers especially are very adaptable and, and out of this stress and these, these, this pressure will always come incredible things. And now we're producing more food ever on fewest resources. So, you know, in your opinion, what are you seeing uh, in terms of even ag tech coming down the line? Given well, the pressures. Yeah, there is, you know, there's so much technology there. Um, you know, we, we have enough food to feed the entire world. We have it. I think um, for now, this is the third administration and it started with secretary Vilsack in the Obama administration of trying to pinpoint what are we doing? How are we wasting this food? What is it that, that keeps us from getting the food to the right places? Well, number one, we've got, we've got waste issues. Uh, now, I probably weigh a little more because when I have a plate, especially with a steak on it, I'm not leaving anything on that plate. Uh, But there are other times where we do. Uh, And, you know, we, maybe we don't eat the whole salad or whatever. Well, we're, we're throwing those out. Uh, You know, I don't know what that solution is, but that's one side of this. I, I don't think we have to get to a point where we're growing so much more food. Now, we can't be taking acres out of what we're doing. And, and obviously, when you've got drought situations uh, and you've got war happening in other parts of the world, you can't reduce the acres. Uh, we probably need to find ways to continue to be more productive on the land that we are. But I think the bigger issue is how can we stop or reduce the amount of waste that we have? That's one part. And then I think the second part of this is we've got food to send to starving people in countries where they need it. But they have to be able to take it. And and certain countries will not accept something because it's GMO. And, and 
Well, we're just not taking it. Well, the end result is your people are going to die. Or when the food is taken but used in a political or military style, and we see that happening. You know, it, that's one I don't know how we how we solve that issue, but those are those are two areas that we have to address. And I know that the administration, uh, the Trump administration, and the Obama administration all had been trying to tee that up. And I'll bet if you ask Secretary Vilsack today, it would be one of the top five issues that is on his mind. Of we have to figure out a way if we're throwing this out. How do we convert it to energy? How do we get something out of this other than just throwing it in the landfill? Yeah, those are great points. And and you you do think, you know, just on garbage day going through your neighborhood, how much waste we're producing. Uh, that's a really great point. I don't I haven't really thought about that in a while. So yeah, so good, good, good points. And uh, I I met you in February at um World Ag Expo in California. Uh, you do a lot of traveling uh, for conferences, shows, and and for your business. So what are you hearing and feeling from exhibitors and attendees after a couple of rough years for the farm show circuit? So what are, what are you hearing there? Sure. And uh, so I was in New Orleans a couple of weeks ago for Commodity Classic. Mm-hmm. Uh, the attendance was down from two years ago. Kind of expected that. Uh, the exhibitor list was down from two years ago. Kind of expected that as well. I think we're it, it. We were in New Orleans, and unfortunately, there has become a political divide over things like mask oh. and over vaccinations, and. I, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to plow right down the middle of this field here because my opinion doesn't matter one way or the other whether I believe you should or shouldn't be vaxxed. It, it's irrelevant. Uh, it's a pothole. Everybody has a pothole in the road, it, it, so I won't go there. But I will say that I think that the attendance was down because in New Orleans, if you're going to eat in a restaurant, go into a bar. You have to show proof of vaccination okay. or the proof of a, of a negative COVID test that's within 72 hours. I was with a guy. We walked into a restaurant and his was 74 hours and they weren't going to let him in. Oh, wow. And that's so when extreme. you're dealing with some of these type issues, yeah, I think there are agriculture for the most part has just said, we don't have time to worry about little things. Not that this is a little thing, but we've had to drive through the fire, if you will. Um, if, if you've got a, a little grass fire going, I'm not talking a wildfire. If you have a little grass fire and you have cattle, they'll go through it. I mean, they don't like the big flames, but they can go through a small little grass fire and survive. Mm-hmm. I think agriculture is kind of at that point where we said we have to go through this. It's going to be painful for a little bit of time, but we've got to get through it. So when you have, you have issues like that going on, I think that's, that's part of what caused uh, the, the attendance to be down uh, and they had dropped the mass mandate, but probably not in time for enough other people to come in. On the other side of that, we were in uh, at World Ag Expo. I think the numbers at World Ag Expo exhibitors were down, but the number of people that I saw was not down. I think the attendance was probably pretty close to where it was two years ago, just at the beginning of, of the COVID outbreak. So uh, those are just some interesting things that I, I picked up on along the way. Um, at this point, I, even though we're talking COVID, that's not really the concern that I'm hearing from exhibitors. The concern from exhibitors, uh, from seed dealers and suppliers is they're concerned this bubble's going to bust. 
Yeah. And when it does, what happens? So in other words, if you've increased the, the, uh, your bag of seed to, let's say, $350, $400, and, and I'm just pulling numbers out of my hat now, but if your, your bag of seed, let's say, is $400, what happens when the price of that commodity is cut in half? Mm-hmm. A producer can't afford that bag of seed anymore. And in other words, we've inflated our, our cost, our, our, um, product values to a point that when it busts and it will, and prices come back down, producers going to have to look for other alternatives. And, and I think there are some though that they're not talking about it very publicly at this point are very concerned about what happens when cotton is no longer a dollar twenty. What happens when it drops back into the eighty cent range? Right. Which, by the way, is below the cost of production. You can't do it anymore for eighty cents. What happens when that the price of of corn comes back down? Or what happens when we have you know eight dollar beans, six dollar beans? We don't like to think about that, but history tells us it will repeat. And when it does, I think that's what some of those exhibitors are really concerned about is their, their livelihood down the road when that happens. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, for sure. So where can people find more information about you and All Ag All Day? Allagnews.com is a good place to go. Uh, Don't look at it right now. I'm behind. I've been on the road pretty much nonstop for the last six weeks. Uh, We were on a really tight ship. Uh, It it might sound big. Our parent company is Paramount Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, And occasionally we'll get something from Paramount or for Paramount Pictures, but it's not really us. Paramount Broadcasting is my wife and I. Stephen Orr handles our affiliations, uh, which is working with other radio stations and sales. Uh, we have Pam Sweeten, who runs our Lubbock office. Mm-hmm. And that's our staff. Wow. We're all ag all day and all ag news. So I, I just say that that sometimes the website gets a little behind and that's my fault. <laughs> so I, I just need to find a few more hours in, in the day. But allagnews.com and from there, uh, you can hear, hear shows. We were actually counting it up the other day, and we started podcasting our show in 2009. Wow. So we have thousands of shows in the archives. Not that any of them are that's any amazing. good. But uh, <laughs> we, we produce four two, actually five. We have three short uh, podcasts that we do each day and then two longer ones. One's about 17 minutes, has a different interview every day with uh, somebody. And then a longer one, which is called Ag Today, which is just tries to cover the gamut of everything that's going on in ag, but allagnews.com. Thank you for asking. Very good. And I have one last question for you. So why do you now you weren't born into the industry, but why do you serve this industry? And what did God put you on this earth for? I don't know. I'm going to answer the last one first, mm-hmm. you know, for years, I wanted to know, okay, Lord, why, I, why am I in this small town that I'd never heard of in my life? What am I doing here? Just, just tell me so I can, I can do the work. And then as I got older, I realized <laughs> When we think we know what we're supposed to do, we go after it, right? That's the whole idea. If, uh, if there's a problem, we tear it apart, try to fix it, right? But maybe if we knew what we were placed here for, we would be working harder to make it happen instead of allowing the Lord to do what he does. And that involves having challenges and frustrations and having high points and low points along the way and meeting people that you would never meet if you knew what your purpose was. And so I don't know what my purpose is, but I don't want to know because I know I'll screw it up. 
So I'll answer the second question first with that. And then your first question is, why do I keep doing this? Um, there's a story to tell and farmers and ranchers. And I've again, growing up in small communities and having good friends, they don't really have the time nor the desire to, to tell their story. They just want to do their work. So what I try to do is be that middle middleman, if you will. I try to provide them information that they might not have time to go get. And in return, I try to share their stories with people who don't know what they do. And I'll, I'll leave you with one final uh, thought here. When I'm in D.C., uh, I meet with members of the House, many of those that I'm meeting with from the House Ag Committee have an idea of what ag is. Some of them are actually farmers or ranchers. Mm -hmm. You get over to the Senate side, and that really dwindles down. The number of, you know, sure, you've got your Chuck Grassleys in there. Um, but the number of, of actual farmers, you don't have them. Um, you have people who are passionate about it. But you have members who don't comprehend, and there's a member right now that I'm, I'm working with and has been gracious enough to provide me some of their time. And when we have an interview, I make sure I don't ask any questions they're not prepared for. I want to build that relationship up to, to a place, and I'll be honest with them as well, I, I want them to feel comfortable enough with me to know that I'm not going to put them in a corner. I'm not going to try to bury them in a hole over something that they're doing that is really bad for ag. Instead, I want to develop that relationship so that at some point in time, maybe I can put them with some people who could help show them how agriculture and, and some of the areas that this legislation would devastate, this member could go and actually see some of that firsthand with Amazing. no politics involved and just know that if, if, I'm, if I'm offering something, it's sincere and it's meant to be helpful, not from a political perspective. I'm not a lobbyist I, and I would be a horrible lobbyist. But can I help people find more information about how what they're doing or proposing to do will affect so many others that they don't know? And that's why I keep doing this. Wow, that's some great perspective. And I can definitely relate to those. I, 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 I love to be a connector. You know, I don't know the answer, I don't know very many answers, but I can connect people and, and help share stories. And that's really, that's really beautiful, right. About what we get to do every day. It, you know, I'm, I'm so blessed, so blessed. Mm -hmm. I, I think we throw in digging ditches and I don't know many people who are out digging ditches, but I could, I could go do that. I could, uh, I could go repair fence, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of fixing fence, but I can go do that if I need to. Um, and go work cattle, which I really enjoy doing. But at the end of the day, I'm so fortunate that, that I get to sit here and just try to connect people, try to give people information. I try not to give my opinion because again, nobody really cares about my opinion. I just try to help people connect the dots and, and what a fortunate thing. And, you know, if I wasn't in this, I wouldn't have met you and wouldn't have learned about all the great things that you're doing as well. So uh, we're just fortunate. And I, I'm just, I'm, I'm glad that you took a few minutes to visit with me. Yeah, that's awesome. And thank you so much. Uh, it's really great hearing, uh, hearing your insight as you have this big umbrella that you are tuned into all the time across, across the, the ag industry. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And thanks to all who are watching or listening. If you want to learn more, the links are provided in the show notes. And don't forget to subscribe to North American Egg Spotlight on YouTube, Rumble, or Egg Peace channels. 
And the podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, Amazon, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Have a great day. Thanks so much for listening to today's Egg Spotlight episode, where we put the spotlight on people and companies doing great things for the agricultural industry. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Stitcher, or on your favorite podcasting platform and give us a five-star review. You can also follow us on YouTube and Rumble to see the video version of Ag Spotlight. Also, head on over to NorthAmericanAg.com to subscribe to our Industry Connect update newsletter. If you're interested in advertising opportunities, email us at connect at NorthAmericanAg.com. Thanks for listening. Our newest podcast by North American Ag is called What Color Is Your Tractor? The stories behind the ag brands you love and the ag brands you love to hate. Hosted by me, Chrissy Wozniak. We take a deep dive into the companies that have built modern agriculture. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. Go to whatcolorisyourtractor.com. Available on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts.